Hello, and welcome to Chagosk Research Insights. My name is Paul Crossan, and I am Beef Enterprise Leader with Chagosk. Research Insights is a series of webinars focused on the latest thinking and research from Chagosk and how this is addressing the challenges and opportunities in the agri-food sector. There are a series of one-hour webinars with Chagosk researchers and are aimed at anyone interested in our research, including professionals in the agri-food industry, other researchers, media, farmers, and policymakers. In this series, we have focused on a number of different areas, including soils and environment, food, viruses, animal breeding, uh, and grassland management. These webinars are all recorded, so if you would like to watch them back, they are available on the Chavez website. Today is the 19th webinar in the series, and the focus is moving to the welfare of farm animals. This is an area of great importance, not only because high animal welfare is associated with high levels of animal performance, but also because of increasing demands from consumers, retailers, and policymakers that we adhere to and indeed demonstrate best practice in animal welfare. Over the next hour, we have three speakers who will discuss different aspects of animal welfare. Firstly, Dr. Mirren Keneally will discuss welfare from a dairy cow perspective. We then have Dr. Bernadette Early, who will address the welfare implications of animal housing alternatives from the perspective of beef cattle. And finally, Dr. Laura Boyle will outline some farm practices to increase the welfare of pigs. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and attendees should use the Q&A function in order to submit their questions. And please include the name of the presenter to whom the question has been addressed. It should be noted that in past webinars, we have had many questions and we are unable to answer them all in the hour that's available, but any which are not addressed during the course of the webinar will be made available afterwards on the Research Insights webpage of the Chagas website. So now I will turn to Dr. Mirren Keneally. And Mirren, if you could share your screen, please. Uh, and Mirren will discuss the welfare uh, from a dairy cow perspective. And I'll hand you over to Mirren now. Mirren. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mirren Keneally, and I'm a researcher working in Moore Park on dairy cow welfare. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about assessing dairy cow welfare. Thanks to everybody who is helping with this work. Focus of this um, presentation is going to be a study that we carried out in uh, 2009. And the purpose of the study was to assess dairy cow welfare during the grazing and housing periods on spring calving pasture-based dairy farms. Um, this study is a subject of a paper which has been recently published. It's been written by my PhD student, Robin Crossley. And uh, the presentation this morning will, will really only touch on um, what's contained in this paper. So if anyone is um, interested in finding out more, I, I would really recommend that you would uh, check out her paper. It's very good. So. Why did we want to investigate the welfare of, of Irish dairy cows? Here in Ireland, we operate a pasture-based system. Cows are out to grass for the majority of the year. And we assume often that cows in a grass-based system have good welfare. It certainly looks good, doesn't it? Cows grazing lovely, lush green fields. But is it? We do know that cows at grass suffer from less lameness and they have greater freedom to express their natural grazing behavior. But we know that there are difficulties that come with being outdoors as well. Cows are at increased risk of parasites and often have to deal with poor weather with lack of shelter. Then let's not forget that the cows don't spend the entire year outdoors. When it comes to win winter time, they transition indoors for approximately four and a half months. And when they do, they have additional challenges to contend with, such as a change in diet, reduced feeding space, increased competition, and a transition from nice soft grass underfoot to hard concrete floors. So what is the welfare status of Irish cows in this system? Until now, little large scale research has been available to tell us that. And it's really important that we know this. Where are we performing well? Where are we performing poorly? so that we know where to focus our improvements. This presentation is not going to deal with specific strategies to improve welfare. It's a really important starting point that will guide future research in this area. 
If anyone has concerns or wishes to improve aspects of their cow's welfare, please contact your vet or your Chagask advisor for advice. So let's step back a little bit. Why is it important to ensure good welfare of our dairy cows? Firstly, there's ethical reasons. Cows are sentient beings with a capacity to feel pain and experience emotions. And it's really important that as carers, we provide animals with a life that's worth living and consumers are demanding this. There's a really important link between welfare and productivity. Animals that have good welfare are less stressed, less immunocompromised as a result and suffer less disease. We all know that healthy animals produce more. And finally, as a country, we are heavily reliant on our image as a clean green producer of sustainable dairy produce. So it's really important that we live up to that image. So the aim of this study was to assess the welfare of cows on Irish dairy farms. And we also wanted to see was there a difference between the grazing and the house periods. To do this, we visited 82 dairy farms in the south of the country. You can see in the map here, um, the counties we visited, the primary dairy producing regions. We visited twice, once during the grazing period and once during the housing period. And we conducted on-farm welfare assessments during which we measured welfare indicators. So before I talk a little bit about what the welfare indicators are, I'll just take a step back and talk a little bit about what, what is good welfare? What does it mean? We can consider good welfare in terms of the three spheres model. And this model of thinking about animal welfare asks three general questions about the animal. Is it functioning well? Is it feeling well? And is it able to live a reasonably natural life? This model of thinking takes into account that all three areas overlap and each one affects the other. So for example, a lame cow will not be feeling well because she's in pain. Her biological functioning will be affected because her milk production and reproductive capacity will be reduced. And also her natural living will be uh, compromised because she is not as mobile and, and isn't able to move around as freely. The WHO states that an animal has good welfare if it's healthy, comfortable, nourished, safe, able to express innate behavior, and is not suffering from unpleasant states such as pain, fear, and distress. So how do we assess welfare? Well, there are two ways. We can look at animal-based indicators. These are measurements taken directly from the animal. So for example, signs of ill health, such as nasal discharge here or lameness. Resource-based indicators are those that are measured from the animal's environment. For example, feed space or water trough depth. And um, animal-based indicators are considered to be the best measure of, of welfare because they provide a true reflection of how the animal is coping within its environment. So back to our study, we measured seven welfare indicators, and here they are. And what I'm going to do is go through each one, just explain a little bit about how we measured it and what we found and what that means, what that says about the welfare status of our cows. So first of all, we measured mobility. We watched each cow as she walked past and we gave her a score from zero to three. So a score zero, um, cow walks normally, as you can see here, freely, with no gait imperfections. A score one cow has a slightly imperfect gait. You can see here the cow's strides are shortened, but we wouldn't actually call her lame. A score two cow is lame, and the lame leg is immediately identifiable. This cow needs treatment. And a score three cow is severely lame. She cannot keep up with the rest of the herd and, and she urgently needs veterinary attention. Score zero and one cows are classified as not lame and score two and three cows are classified as lame. So what did we find? So in this, in this graph, you can see here that the majority of the cows scored in the not lame category. Um, the majority were zero and one for both grazing and housing, and there was really no difference. There was an average of nine and 10% clinically lame cows for the housed and grazing periods respectively. 
So this is low compared to intensive systems, which typically report a lameness prevalence of around 30%. But still, is one in 10 lame cows okay? If you ask the average consumer of dairy products that question, I'm not certain that they, they would be okay with that. Also, if we look at the range, we can see we had a range from 1% right up to 31%. So this shows that lameness is a significant problem on many farms in Ireland. We also looked at body condition score. We scored cows from uh, one to five, basically from very thin to very fat. During the grazing period, we would like our cows to be between 2.75 and 3.25. And we found in our study that the vast majority of cows did fall within this target. During the housing period, we like them to be a little heavier. They should be somewhere between three and 3.5. Again, most of the cows in our study, 77% fell within this. So we can say that in general, cows are obtaining adequate nutrition. So then we looked at ocular discharge or eye discharge, we scored from zero, normal, up to three, heavy discharge. And what we found was that a very small proportion of cows were suffering from discharge in the moderate or severe category, in and around 1% for both grazing and housing. So we can say that in general, ocular health is good. We did the same with nasal discharge, scored it from zero up to three. And what we can say about this, what did we find was higher results here. We found that 7% of cows during the grazing season scored um, moderate or severe. And this was slightly higher than what we found during the housed period. Cows were scoring 5% for moderate and severe discharge. So what does this mean? Well, the welfare quality assessment protocol, which is the gold standard assessment protocol for dairy cows, sets a target threshold of 5%, a warning threshold. So you can see that for the grazing period, we were above this tar target, and for the housing period, we were right at the target. So this suggests that there is some degree of compromised health, and this is an area that requires further research. Then we looked at tail injuries. We measured lacerations, breaks, and docks. And we found that there was no difference between the grazing and the housing periods. We found a level of 2 to 3% tail lacerations, 9% breaks, and 7.5% docks. Now, clearly, this is, is a relatively high rate of uh, tail injury and something of a concern, especially considering that tail docking is prohibited in Ireland. So further investigation is required, as well as improved enforcement of existing legislation. We looked at skin damage. We divided the cow's body up into five parts, as you can see here, and we measured the lesions that were present in each part. And what we found was that during the grazing period, the majority of lesions were present on the hindquarters. 26% of cows had lesions in this area. During the housing period, Lesions were much more prevalent in the neck, shoulder, back, and head region. 66 um, cows had lesions in this area. And followed by lesions in the hindquarters. So uh, the lesions during the grazing season were primarily mind, mild, um, just skin um, hair loss mostly. And this is, is probably a, a result of uh, normal mounting behavior during estrus. Uh, during the winter period, it's most likely a result of the cow coming into contact with features of her environment, such as cubicles. And similarly with the head and neck region, most likely as a result of coming into contact with the feed barrier. So clearly improvement is required in this area. Finally, we did an avoidance test. And this is a test of the behavior of the cows. And here you can see Robin performing a test in the field and what she does is she approaches the cow according to a standardized procedure and she measures the distance at which the cow retreats. So if a cow allows Robin to come, if a cow retreats before Robin uh, 
comes within one meter, this is classified as a fearful response. If the cow allows Robin to come closer than one meter with an extended hand or allows her to touch her, this is classified as a non-fearful response. And we found that during the grazing season, 82% of cows displayed a fearful response. And this was much reduced during the housing period. Cows that were tested at the feed phase um, uh, responded with a non a fearful response in only 42% of cases. So this demonstrates that as cows become less, have less contact with humans during the grazing period, they become less comfortable around them. And um, you know, there, there is probably improvement um, required in this area too. So to conclude, Irish farms perform favorably in meeting body condition targets, ocular health, and definitely compared to other countries, we're performing well in terms of lameness. Improvements are needed in skin damage during housing, reduction in tail injuries, and in nasal health probably avoidance behavior as well. And because lameness is such a, a severely painful condition for cows and has such a negative impact on their welfare, um, we really do need to improve in this area as well, despite our low level, relatively speaking. Okay, so thanks to everybody who helped and thanks to everyone for listening and apologies again for the, um, the hiccup at the start. Very good. Thank you very much, Maren, for that uh, really interesting overview of your research into the welfare of dairy cows. Uh, can I ask uh, Bernadette, please, to put your slides up? Um, just in the meantime, while Bernadette's putting her slides up, I just want to remind the attendees that, you know, you can submit your questions on the Q&A function. Um, we will address them at the end. I will wait until the finish of the three presentations uh, and we'll address the Q&A at that stage. Uh, so with that, I'll hand you over to Bernadette. Good morning, and thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. The topic of my presentation this morning is beef, cattle, housing, and welfare implications. I will just uh, set some of the background really for you with some of the issues that we see facing the beef industry. And certainly over the past while, we've had a number of questions that are directed towards us about the welfare of animal in our, animals in our finishing system, particularly in relation to housing. Those concerns are coming from both EU and UK retailers, and they're expressed mainly around the welfare of beef cattle on concrete slatted floors. During this presentation, I've highlighted um, concrete slatted floors, a CSF in, in the blue uh, font. Issues are also raised by, by the EU and uh, as well as by international health and welfare advisory bodies. And in particular, we're talking about the European Food Safety Authority, the Scientific Committee for Animal Health and Animal Welfare, and the World Organization for Animal Health or the OIE, which also has animal welfare within its remit. So the, those concerns are the issues raised are that there should be an increase in the space allowance for finishing animals, a phasing out of the use of concrete slatted floor sheds. And a, the, an alternative to this would be to provide a solid lying area with bedding or slats with rubber mats. And at present, there is no EU regulation yet concerning finishing animals. So with this in mind, we, we, uh, I want to present to you a study which we carried out addressing two aspects. One is uh, space allowance and floor type. And this study is, uh, was published back in, in 2017. So today I will just highlight some of the main points uh, relating to the study. We had 240 late maturing continental crossbred beef heifers and they were assigned to one of four treatments. This study was carried out in the one facility, in a large facility, such, such that we could accommodate all animals within the same environment. We had three space allowances on concrete slatted floor sheds. That was a three meter squared, 4.5 and a six meter squared per animal. 
In addition to that, we had a straw bedded treatment where we animals were assigned to six meters squared in the same facility. And I'll explain in a little bit more detail what, how that uh, system was set up. The animals were weighed, uh, dirt scored, that was to assess their cleanliness, and they were blood sampled every 21 days. And as Murrin mentioned in the previous, in her previous presentation, to assess welfare, we have also to look at what we call the biological functioning of the animal in addition to, let's say, the performance variables as well as behavior. Um, all four hooves of each animal was examined at the start and the end of the study because we were interested to see was there any change um, in, as regards hoof lesions because there was evidence in the literature to suggest that housing animals, you know, will have an impact on their hoof health. We also recorded animal behavior using CCTV uh, recordings and carcass measurements were collected post slaughter. Our experimental timeline was as follows. Uh, two days before the study commenced at day zero, we weighed the animals twice and they were then assigned to treatment on day zero. On that day, we collected um, blood samples. This was for um, looking at welfare biomarkers in the blood. We scored the animals for cleanliness and we examined the hooves and also assigned them then to treatment. Um, I should also note or mention here that we had 60 animals per treatment and we had six pens per treatment. So the experimental unit in this study was the actual pen. So this is really how we would describe um, a well-powered uh, scientific study. And then I've just represented there the, um, the body cleanliness or the dirt scoring procedure that we, we utilized. We divided the body parts into 16 and each part then was scored from one to five, one being clean, five being dirty. We, um, on day 104 then, which was the, the day before slaughter, the animals were weighed and again, blood samples collected and dirt scored. The animals then were slaughtered on day 105. Hoof lesions again were recorded. We collected the, the hooves from the animals and assess them for, um, for lesions. And we collected then our post slaughter measurements. <clears throat> Animal behavior was recorded continuously, but for the purpose of, of this study, I'm showing you here, I will refer to the behavior collected between day 70 and day 87 of the study. The experimental pens in the cattle unit were as follows. So we had 24 pens, and the treatments, as you can see here, are, are color-coded such that they're randomized throughout the shed itself. So there is, um, there is no bias as such in terms of different treatments, all treatments being beside each other. The feed face was a standard length for each pen, even though the space allowance was more generous, let's say for the 4.5 and the six meters squared. The feed face length was a standard 4.5 meter. Uh, I'll just show you now some photographs of the animals at the space allowance on a three meter squared per animal on concrete slatted floors represented here. Again, the animals would have adequate space considering there are 10 animals per pen. If we look then at the photograph with the 4.5 meter squared, a little bit more generous space. Um, again, uh, typical of, the, of a shed situation. This again represents the animals at six meters squared on the slats. And you'll notice here in this photograph, and this is uh, very typical of animals in that they will always more or less lie together. And even though they have more space, they, can, they will lie together. And this is part of the predatory instinct that animals have naturally, such that if one animal is alerted in some way, they can, uh, let's say they can trigger other animals to rise and move. And this is part of the herding of animals. You'll also notice that on the floor here, there's a little bit more dirt. And this is as a consequence of the fecal material not being treaded through the, through the concrete slats or this, the void area. Um, this is a photograph just showing the, the animals at six meters squared on straw. 
And to maintain this straw, the, the straw was placed on top of a geotextile membrane, and this membrane allowed water and urine to pass through to the tank underneath. It was necessary, however, to replenish this straw, and 150 kg was added per pen every three days. So the allowance per animal was 5 kg, which is the recommended weight. The straw then was fully removed and replaced every two weeks. I'll take you briefly through some of the results. And as I mentioned, this study is published. It's in the scientific domain. We found no difference in dry matter intake. Uh, we did find some differences in average daily gain. But the ultimate measure in terms of performance was the carcass weight. And we find no difference in carcass weight at the three space allowances on slats. 3, 4.5, and 6. If we then do the comparison of the concrete slats at 6 meter with the straw at 6 meters squared, again, there was no difference in the dry matter intake. There's a slight numerical increase in carcass weight, but it did not reach a statistical significance. So overall, there's no major um, effect really in terms of animal performance some differences in average daily gain, but it didn't translate, as we said, into carcass weight. We also noticed that the hide weight, because we collected the hide post slaughter, was actually heavier on the animals coming off the straw than on the concrete slats at six meters squared. And this is explained as follows, because when we look at the dirt scores of the animals over time, you can see that as animals first enter into the shed or into the facility, with the change in the adaptation to diet, they will start to get um, dirty or the hide will start to become more dirty as such. Remembering that this is our body scoring system here. So as the animals, uh, you know, as the duration of the study increases, you can see that animals start to clean up. However, the animals on the straw remained dirtier even up to from day 84 up to 105 even though we had maintained maintained that bed very very well there was no difference however between cattle housed on concrete slats at the three space allowance in terms of dirt scores and as i mentioned the, that statistical difference was there with the straw versus the concrete slats at six meters squared in terms of the welfare variables that we looked at, we found no difference in the number of hoof lesions or in the blood immune variables that we, we collected. The lying time also, the behavioral responses of animals was not different at the three space allowances on slats. However, we did find that the duration of lying was increased by one hour per day with the, when the animals were um, on the straw bed at six meter compared with the, straw, with the concrete slats at six meters squared. If we then look at uh, some of the conclusions from, from this work, then you'll notice or, or we would like to conclude in terms of space allowance is that increasing space allowance above three meters squared, it had no effect on animal intake or carcass weight. The animal welfare, it was not affected by space allowance. That was the space allowance at three, 4.5 and six meters squared on, on slats. In terms of floor type with the heifers on straw, there was an improvement in average daily gain, but no effect on carcass weight. And we also found that the animals were dirtier on the straw than those were dirtier on the straw bedded system than those on the slats by the day of slaughter of day 105. And the lying time was increased by one hour on straw bedding. We also, just to qualify this work as well, we wanted to see, well, what does the international scientific literature say in relation to space allowance? To answer this question, we carried out what is typically called a meta-analysis of all avail available data in the literature. So here I have represented on the left side a space allowance of less than two meters squared per animal and a space allowance of between two to three meters squared. 
And just to note as well that we would not house animals at a space less than two metres squared, in particular an animal, a finishing animal of 500 kg. You'll notice here that animals housed at a reduced space allowance, that there is a uh, significant difference here coming through in terms of average daily gain, feed conversion ratio, carcass weight, lying time, and uh, not, no change actually in dirt scores. Well, there was just one study there, so that was, there was no change represented. However, if we look at the data as well, the international data from two to three meters squared compared with greater than three meters squared, there is no significant difference coming through except for dirt scores where the animals at a reduced space here were dirtier than ones at a space allowance greater than three. So that is coming from what's already published in the, in the scientific domain as regards scientific literature. If we also use the same approach and say, well, what does the international scientific literature say in relation to underfoot conditions? And in this case, we're comparing concrete slatted floors with straw bedded. Again, looking at average daily gain, feed conversion ratio, carcass weight, lying time and dirt scores, the studies are showing no significant um, advantage when you compare concrete slats with a straw bedded system. And the other alternative which we looked at and we're progressing some of this work at present is, well, what does the scientific uh, literature say in relation to concrete slats versus the other alternative, which was rubber mats. And again, the literature represented here by the number of studies included in the in the uh, meta-analysis show no significant difference. Average daily gain, feed conversion ratio, carcass weight, lying time and dirt scores. So with that, I have presented to you some of the work we have carried out on, on this important area. And this work will inform uh, policy as well as address consumer concerns and retailer concerns regarding animal housing for finishing cattle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Uh, really excellent overview of, of, of uh, a hugely important area and uh, many questions being asked on this area at present. So uh, really great to see that and to see that we have a, a, a you know, very strong program in this area. Um, can I ask Laura to maybe load up her presentation? Um, again, just while Laura is loading up her presentation, again, to remind uh, attendees, you can submit your um, questions on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'd ask you to please do so. Uh, we will address that uh, at the end of Laura's presentation. So, Laura. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> can you just give me a heads up that you can see the correct screen, my presentation screen, yeah? Yeah, see it perfectly, yeah. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge that this is work conducted by my colleague, Keelan O'Driscoll and I in the Peak Development Department, work we've been doing for, for the past decade. And I'm going to talk to you about pigtails. <clears throat> and the pigtail as an iceberg indicator of pig welfare. And thanks to Bernie and Myrne for great introductions to the whole topic of animal welfare. So if you were to go into a farm and could uh, to assess the welfare and um, health of the pigs and you could only look at one thing and, and that was the pig's tail and you saw that all the pigs had a nice long curly tail that was being held upright, what would that tell us about the welfare of the pig? Well, it would probably tell us that the housing on the farm was, was in tip top condition, the animals weren't overstocked, the ventilation was good. The feeding was right, that they had enough to feed, that they were fed frequently and it was the proper composition diet and that the animals were not unwell. And if you liken this to, a, to an iceberg then, so what it's basically telling us that if we only look at the tip of the iceberg, the tail being the tip of the iceberg, it's really telling us that what's going on below the surface is all really good and that the welfare of the pigs is good and that they're as happy as the proverbial pig in, in, in mud, we'll say to be polite. So that's what an iceberg indicator is. But why have we been focusing on tails for the past 10 years? Well, tail biting is the reason. And tail biting is a major welfare problem in pig production. And it involves the oral manipulation of tails. You can see the pigs in the picture there uh, manipulating another pig's tail. And of course, and unsurprisingly, it causes pain, fear, it reduces performance. 
it causes disease and carcass condemnation. And really importantly, it also leads to a use of antimicrobials or antibiotics, which is a major global challenge when you think of antimicrobial resistance. So obviously the pig that's having its tail bitten is having very poor welfare because of the pain and fear, et cetera. But the pig that's actually biting is also displaying poor welfare. And the reason is we keep pigs in fairly bar barren environments and they haven't changed much in spite of the fact that we've domesticated them for 8,000 years. So they still like to forage and spend a lot of their time rooting and exploring. And if they don't have anything to do that in, they're redirected to the other pig's tail. Now there's about 80 risk factors that contribute to tail biting. So it's a hugely complex and multifactorial problem. And I won't go into them all, but that's an important point to make. So how do we address it currently? Well, we cut the pig's tail off. And this is done within a few hours or days of birth. And indeed, it is successful in reducing the risk of tail biting, but docking in itself also causes injury, pain and fear in the piglets. And arguably, we're addressing the symptom, you know, and not the causes of tail biting. And indeed, routine tail docking is actually banned by the EU. And they say that you must look at all other aspects of the housing and management before you're allowed to dock pig's tails. And a recent nice paper talked about the fact that this legislation has actually been in effect for nearly a quarter of a century. And, um, and the fact of the matter is that 99% of Irish pigs are still tail docked. And this isn't so dissimilar to many other EU countries. And the fact of the matter is that we're looking at a situation where there could be infringement proceedings taken against about 20 member states, unless we make a huge effort to start um, producing long tailed pigs. So why is it such a challenge to um, address tail biting and why are we only um, addressing this challenge by tail docking? Well, if you think of the pig's ability to cope with a whole range of stressors, like I mentioned, boredom or um, poor ventilation or feeding problems, the pig's ability to cope, you know, we all have a certain limit to our capacity to cope and their bucket could uh, fill up quite significantly in intensive pig farming. But if something pushes them over the edge, like a disease challenge or something, what you see is this manifests itself in tail biting. So really it's a reflection of the pig's absolute inability to cope with the environment in which it lives. And the resulting problem is of course tail lesions and these range from um, you know, minor to quite severe. And if we think of our iceberg and go back to our iceberg then, and we think that tail biting and tail lesions can also be an indicator of what's going on under the surface really, um, if we see tail biting or tail lesions in pigs, we can tell that there's a whole lot of complex issues going on underneath the surface of that iceberg tip. And really the welfare of the pigs is not good. So what is the objectives of our work? I guess it's to eventually strive towards a population of pigs that has this nice long curly tail. And we know, I suppose we're trying to save the pig tail um, ultimately, but we know this can be done. And these are authors from Finland where pig uh, tail docking is completely banned and they are able to raise pigs with long tails. So Anna Valras and colleagues would argue that we should all be making a better effort to do so as well. So the objectives of our work and what I'm going to talk to you today about are the prevalence of tail biting. So to understand the problem, we first of all need to know how prevalent is it? What are the economic implications? What do Irish pig producers think about it? And then some solutions. And, and these are areas Keelan and I have been working on for the past 10 years, looking at solutions at farm level and at the level of the slaughterhouse. So if we first of all look at the prevalence of, 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 of tail biting in pigs. So we conducted this study on about 31 Irish pig farms and we looked at the first stage, second stage. So these are different stages of growth in the pig or of production. And it's in the finisher stage that you really see the most tail lesions with about 10% on average of farms having pigs with tail lesions, but up to nearly a quarter of pigs on some farms having tail lesions. We've also done work in the abattoirs looking at carcass tail lesions where we stand on the line and we score the, the severity of the lesions from zero to four, a little bit like what Mirren described with her locomotion scores. And we found, and this was nearly 40,000 pigs, we found that about 6% on average had moderate to severe tail lesions. So if you look at these scores um, the, at the upper end of the scale. And I think the important thing to tell you about this is the docking, even though we've a docked population of pigs, it does not eliminate tail biting. What are some of the costs then? So the first bit of work we did was looked at the cost of these tail lesions at the, at the end point of sale, we'll say. And we saw that the carcasses of pigs that had higher lesion scores were significantly lower in weight. So obviously that's a, a major hit to the, the, the farmer that's selling the carcasses because they get paid on kilogram of meat. And we also found that as the scores of the tails went up, you've got an increased risk of 
uh, condemning the carcass because of abscessation. You can see an abscess there in the pelvic region of this pig due to a bitten tail. And we were able to calculate the cost of this and we found that now these prices are a little bit higher, it was 1.1 euro 70 per kilo, they're a bit below that at the moment, but that in average the producers were losing about 273 uh, euros per pig, which is a considerable cost. More recently, we've used the Chagas pig production model to model the cost of production. So the previous slide was the end of sale, the point of sale losses. This shows you what you're losing during the production cycle. And we found that an average of 0.86 prevalence of severe tail lesions on a farm was associated with nearly a 5% reduction in average daily gain, so in growth rate performance. And because the pigs were growing slower, it took them longer to reach the target slaughter weight. And this resulted in more feed being used, which is a huge cost in pig production. So the end result was a reduction in farm profit by 15%. So um, we asked then, this is work that Keelan did with Amy Haig, where they decided, let's talk to farmers about their perceptions of tail biting. And they found that 96% of farmers had a tail biting problem on their farm, and 80% considered 1% to 2% acceptable. And when you think that 0.86% results in um, a, uh, a reduction of profit at 15%, this is a bit high of a tolerance. And when we talked to them about the different um, about the topics, all these different areas came up. Feed was a major issue, but an area I'm going to talk to you in the next few minutes is enrichment. And there's a reason I want to focus on enrichment, and it's really because enrichment is also enshrined in the pig directive or, or EU legislation, we'll say, on pig production. And really, um, it says that pigs should have straw, hay, wood, sawdust, mushroom compost to enable proper investigation. And it goes back to what I said earlier about pigs being so um, inquisitive and wanting to be always active and investigating their environment. And this is a video of piglets, um, long-tailed piglets, interestingly, from Keelan's work in a farming crate, which is typically a fairly barren environment. And these are only little pots from the garden center. And you can see the level of interest in those um, devices. So it really emphasizes how, um, how keen they are to explore their environment. When Keelan and Amy talked to the farmers about enrichment, wood featured really strongly. And the reason is that in fully slashed environments, it's really hard to provide pigs with anything um, with really good enrichment materials because it'll fall down through the slats. So a lot of farmers use wood. And a focus of Keelan um, and Amy's and um, Keelan's research then in, in, in recent years was on looking at different types of wood to see, you know, different hardnesses of wood, for example, and um, which would uh, prevent tail biting or tail directed behavior. And typically the wood would be provided to pigs in a in a like a post like this in the pen. And they have a number of studies on um, looking at wood and looking at wood in conjunction with perhaps some rubber toys. And this was in docked pigs, I should say. So we said, let's try and get on top of the problem of tail biting in the docked population before we start trying to produce pigs with long tails. But really they found while the pigs did use those devices, they didn't have any effect on tail biting. So Keelan and another student, Jen Yun Chu, devised a whole range of slash compatible enrichment. So they looked at giving enrichment substrates in racks like paper, grass, straw, and all a whole array of just like a playpen, if you like, um, of different devices that wouldn't go down through the slats, if you like. And you can see how, um, how active, again, the pigs were. And these were pigs in a pen of 12 pigs, maybe 14, maybe 12 pigs, and they had eight enrichment devices. And you can see how busy they are. And even in spite of having eight enrichment devices, you can still see this pig over in the corner manipulating his pen mate. So they really need a lot to keep them active and, and, and busy. Um, Keelan also looked at the rate of replenishment. So if you're giving them paper and or, um, or silage or whatever, and it runs out all the time, um, that's not going to be too much good to them. So when they um, provide an optimal rate of replenishment, they did get this reduction in damaging behaviors, which is what we want to achieve. But more interestingly, they also saw that the pigs that were getting this, you know, the racks replenished regularly with whatever substrate had a higher growth rate. And that's really important for the, for the farmer, obviously. Moving on then just to the, the slaughterhouse solutions that, that we looked at. So I suppose for a, a, quite a few years, we were interested in the fact that, um, you know, when you're looking at pigs in the farm, it's quite difficult because they're dirty, there's dark conditions, you have a biosecurity risk. But the abattoir provides a really great place to inspect pigs because they're clean, 
um, you know, you're not you're not risking the disease status of the farm, and you can see many pigs from many herds on the, at the one visit. So we wrote a paper about how it would make really good sense from an economic and animal welfare point of view to score welfare on the dead pig, if you like. And we got funding from the Department of Agriculture to conduct the pig welfare project. And I suppose our main interest was on tail lesions because they are the most you know, visible, easily recorded lesion on the carcass. And what do they tell us about pig welfare on the farm? Of course, it's really important to keep the human in the loop as Keelan did with their work where they consulted the pig producers about what they thought about tail biting. And we did a lot of stakeholder groups where we talked to processors and vets and pig farmers to see what they thought about this idea of measuring the tails at slaughter and what would it tell us about pig welfare on the farm. So we did a range of research looking at where the best place is to look at the tails, what the carcass lesions could tell us about the lifetime health of the pig. We looked at the effect of record keeping. If you were, for example, a client of the Chagas Pig Advisory Service, did that mean that you would have you know, better tail health than if not. And we looked at the relationship with lung health and we did indeed see that there's this relationship between tail biting and lung health and a whole range of other studies. And ultimately at the end of the day, we were able to validate carcass lesions as indicators for on-farm health and welfare. And um, so we found that these tail lesions were related to, and I'm sorry, that's a bit small there, but things like bursitis on farm, huddling, coughing even, we saw associations between the tail lesion score of the pig at the factory and its life on the farm, we'll say. So I, I, this was the first step in validating tail lesions as, as an iceberg indicator of pig welfare. And we published a protocol that the department is using um, to implement this in, in abattoirs in Ireland. So we learned that tail biting is a highly prevalent and costly problem. We learned that farmers tend to underestimate the impact of tail biting and the associated lesions. There is a severe challenge with fully slatted flooring, but it can be overcome. But the optimal enrichment regimes that are needed to overcome this problem are costly and labor intensive. We know now that carcass tail lesions are good iceberg indicators of pig welfare on farm. And if we can inform producers by feeding back that information from what's found at the factory, it can help them maybe make adjustments to their management and housing to try and reduce the problem of tail biting, which could have huge benefits, not only for pig welfare, but for you know, in, in antibiotic use and um, financial um, performance of the farm. So I think we're on a journey to, to, the, to the, long, the long tail and the long curly tail and the happy pig that, that it is associated with. But we have certainly done made major steps in getting there in the past 10 years. And I'd like to thank you and all the people that were too many to name who contributed to this research. And I'm going to take the opportunity to draw your attention to a conference that Keelan and I are, are um, arranging. It's virtual, but it's the welfare of animals at farm and group level. And the deadline for early bird registration is about to close on the 1st of June. So we'd really love if some people in the audience would register for that, um, for that conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, again, a really excellent presentation. And I suppose an outstanding example of the research approach going from identifying the problem, quantifying the impact and developing solutions. So really, really excellent presentation. And I, I like to end point so we're on the journey, journey to the long curly tail, it seems to me. So really a really nice way to finish up. So can I ask uh, Bernadette and Mirren maybe to um to to uh, show your show your faces again. So show your video. So we have a number of questions coming through, and I might go back uh, to Mirren maybe uh, while uh, Laura and Bernadette maybe just catch their breath. Um Mirren, I suppose just in terms of really nice videos there of cattle walking to pasture and you show different levels of lameness. Particularly animal with a lame score of three was, was particularly lame. What would the recommendation be for that animal in a pasture-based system? He was clearly, or that animal was clearly struggling to, to return to pasture. Yes, well, um, I mean, that animal needs to be seen by a vet straight away. And, you know, really key in treating these animals is to minimize the amount of walking that they're that they're doing so she should be kept in a in a pass in a pasture in a field very close to the the, the milking parlor and she shouldn't be walking long distances at all she should be milked once a day um, to reduce her walking time and she needs pain relief and that's critical and um you know further work that we have done showed that the 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 amount of farmers who are actually doing these these things is is pretty low. Only eight percent of farmers are using um, 
uh, pain relief for severely lame cows. And only 12% of farmers are keeping them in a paddock close to the milking parlor. So those are areas that we really need to improve. Okay, okay, thank you. And, and just when I, when I, when I have you, Mirren, um, the tail lacerations, so you had, I think, 2 to 3% lacerations, 9% breaks. Um, what, what are the likely causes of that, or, or can you... Can you give some indication of how, do you, how that happens? Yeah, so I suppose like our research doesn't answer that question definitively, but we, we theorize that um, likely causes during the housing period are the scrapers. Um, and uh, during, during the rest of the year, uh, a probable cause is the application of, of tail tape that is too tight and um, you know using, used during breeding and, and so on to mark cows. Um, and that isn't removed and that that causes damage in, in that way. Okay, okay, thank you, Marina. I know you didn't mention at the beginning that there's a further study to to look at, I suppose, solutions to some of these yeah. some of these challenges at, yeah. at farm level. So we look forward to that. Uh, Berndale, if I can if I can move to your presentation perhaps. Um, you know, straw, you you you've looked at straw and I know you're continuing to look at straw in, in ongoing experimentation. Uh, we, we know that the availability of, of straw is, is, is more, much more limited in Ireland than in continental mm -hmm. Europe and the UK. So is it really a practical solution for housing in Ireland? So is it, um, well, I suppose, Paul, you know, what we have to consider there is labour, space, availability and cost. Mm -hmm. And most of the space allowances for animals housed on straw, it's actually it's up on four metres squared per, per animal. In our study, we reported a six meter squared. So we did a doubling, let's say, of a, of a three meter squared um, allowance. Certainly the, the, you know, the allowance that we gave was five kg per head. But if we look at data that was published way back, I think it was in the 1980s, um, in Ireland, we would have sufficient straw for two months of the winter, or if we housed animals or, you know, allowed them an allowance of uh, uh, three kg, if we go to six kg per animal, we would have sufficient straw for one month of the winter. So it's not really an option in our uh, systems, considering that we have over 70,000 um, slatted floor sheds, even at the minute. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Laura, just a question here. Um, what, what are the main challenges or the major challenges pig producers face in stopping tail docking? Um, well, Paul, I suppose the one I touched on was the, the slatted floors. So that's what they're ubiquitous in Ireland is, is slatted flooring. So that's a, getting that good enrichment in is a big challenge, but it's not anyway. Enrichment in itself won't solve the problem. As you saw, it's a multifactorial problem. There are challenges in terms of um, productivity. We have very highly prolific sows now that are producing a lot of live born piglets. So the stocking densities on farms have gone up. And um, the difficulty is in acquiring capital and all the planning, et cetera, that you go through to build extra housing. So there's, there's a whole number. And then, of course, the biggest issue is the poor return on, 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 on pig meat. You know, it's, it's bottom, bottom, bottom dollar um, return for the farmer and um, cost of production are rising and the cost of, of the meat itself at the retail end is, is staying the same or is reducing. So it's that bind of that cheap food bind that, that they are in. Um, but there's also, um, you know, some attitudinal change that's needed because it is a journey. And even in the pig unit here in Moorpark, we have to go on a journey to raising long tail pigs. And it's not an easy one. It takes a lot of perseverance, labor and a good mindset and an innovative mindset. So they would be some some of the challenges. OK, and, and we've seen a lot of the development of technology in other areas of of pig farming, but also cattle farming and so on. So, so do technology and sensors, do they have a role to play in, in, in this regard? They do indeed. And that's that's seen as the great white hope of, of tail biting is that we can detect it automatically or detect it before it happens automatically. A bit like lameness in the cow that, that we, before they get that bad, some of those horrendous pictures I showed you, that we, we can we can cut it off at the, at the head it off, we'll say. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, Keelan and I are involved in a project that's going to develop sensors for measuring tail biting on farm and hopefully also measure the tail lesions in the factory because it's not really sustainable for someone to have to stand there and score the thousands of pigtails that go by, you know. So these are areas where technology could play a huge role. Thank you, Laura. And again, keep your questions coming in on the on the Q and A function. Uh, Mirren, uh, uh, on the on the tail breaks again, a question coming in here on on, on that issue. 
How did you determine table rates? Was it by palpitation or, or just by visual assessment? Yeah, yeah, we, we palpated, we handled the tails, we visually assessed them as well. And we, we could, you know, when a cow is a, a, a tail break, you can feel a very obvious deviation in her, in okay. her bone okay, structure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, and just a, a second question, Miran, when, when you have the floor. Um, interested to hear about how levels of lameness are assessed in dairy herds. Um, when we conclude that Irish cows fare better than others, how is this comparison drawn? Well, I'm, when, I, when I'm saying we compare favourably, we're, we're comparing favourably with similar studies, prevalent studies um, in, that have been done in other countries. Um, and, you know, there are different scoring systems used in different studies, but, um, you know, most of them are, you know, similar to, to the one that we used. And they're pretty comparable in that regard. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, a question, I suppose, for everyone, really, and I might ask you first, Bernie, in terms of quality assurance schemes. So we are monitoring animal welfare parameters. What do you think or, or what, what do you foresee or, or have you any information in terms of, of changes to future uh, quality assurance schemes? And I'll, I'll ask Laura and Miriam the same question, but just maybe first for yourself. Yeah, well, certainly we, we work alongside or we inform, let's say, Board B of our, our research and of our, uh, the outputs. And certainly there are, you know, good recommendations coming from, from the research. I suppose we're un unique here in Ireland in that we, we do carry out the research like um, on, let's say, on the animal side, like as Murren and, and Laura have presented as well. That is a, a unique situation that we have we have the scientific data to inform um, you know those particular changes um i suppose we also work within with european partners as well and you know Murren mentioned as well the welfare quality and welfare quality assessments we did um, a large study where we looked at animal welfare on farms in ireland and compared the welfare with an intensive system in belgium and you know, the welfare we reported came out more favorably in terms of the Irish systems compared with the European. And certainly the period we had animals at grazing contributed as well to the overall uh, index of assessment. So that's really puts us, you know, in a competitive advantage, let's say in terms of Ireland with our systems. And I think that's good information as well to link back to our quality assurance schemes and you know, that the research will guide the, the practice. Okay, thanks. Uh, Laura, briefly, just in terms of the pig sector, uh, any changes that you can see coming through in terms of welfare assessments? Well, across all sectors, Paul, one of the biggest challenges with quality assurance schemes is the fact that they don't include those animal-based indicators that Mirren uh, referred to. I mean, really, the information is very resource-based. We're relying on a lot of paper documentation for um, uh, welfare assessment for quality assurance schemes. And EFSA have come out strongly saying that animal-based indicators are the best way to detect animal welfare, measure animal welfare and farm. We have a whole range of them at our disposal, which the three of us um, showed. And um, some of them are trickier to measure and might need the benefit of, 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 of technology. But until we get them into the quality assurance schemes, really, they're not doing what it says in the tin. And Mirren, uh, just in terms of the welfare assessment for quality assurance? Yeah, I 100% agree with Laura. We really need to get the, the animal-based welfare indicators into the quality assurance schemes because otherwise they're not telling us what the welfare status of the animal is. You know, we can, we can have all of the resource-based indicators and they are important, but it won't tell us how the animal is coping in its environment. So I, I agree with Laura completely. Okay, very good, very good. So it's, I suppose it's something to, to mark for the future maybe and maybe technology has a role to play there. Mm. Uh, Mirren, just in terms of the, um, uh, particularly the lesions and, and that aspect of welfare that you addressed, a uh, very uh, uh, appropriate question here in terms of differentiating between natural behaviour and management factors. So obviously mounting of animals during heat and heat expression is a natural behaviour. Yeah. Um, how did you differentiate those as an animal welfare issue as opposed to a, a natural behavioural issue? Uh, you know, issue that we would see on farms. Yeah, so like when we looked at the lesions, we couldn't tell precisely what caused it. But I guess we're looking at the big picture 
and looking at the fact that the lesions during the grazing period were mild, you know, there was no actual skin damage, it was just hair loss. And we know that that coincided with the period where animals would be um, performing natural uh, mounting behavior. So we can judge from that, that it, that's the likely cause and that it's not a serious welfare issue. Whereas the injuries indoors were, you know, more severe, involved actual damage to the skin and as a result are a more serious welfare issue. Okay, so that was part of your consideration in terms of how you scored them animals then? The, the, the yeah, well, like we scored, we scored, you know, a zero would be just just hair loss um, going right up to um, a three. I can't remember the exact scoring system, but it takes account of how the number of lesions and the severity of lesions. And that's, that's, there's huge detail in there. Again, it's all in Robin's paper, so I kind of had to simplify it for the purposes of the presentation. But if anyone wants more detail, um, it's all there in the in the paper as well. Okay, okay. A question, Bernie, uh, on uh, on this budding. I know it isn't something you cover, but I know that you do have a, a large body of, of research in this area. An opinion on imposing a requirement for the budding calves? Um, well, at the moment, it is a, a legislative requirement uh, with calves over two weeks of age that they should be disbudded using a product which is known as adrenocaine. And a farmer can administer that, a stock person can administer it as long as they've received, let's say, training or under the guidance of a vet. Up to two weeks of age, if the horn buds are present, they can be removed without the use of a local anaesthetic or analgesia. But if, if, the calf, if the calf bud becomes attached to the skull, that's when it becomes more problematic and a more longer acting anaesthetic may be required to be administered. And then this anaesthetic needs to be administered by a vet. So the, the objective really is to disbud as soon as the buds appear. But to qualify that as well, just to say to you that the, dis, the horn buds appear later in beef calves than they do in dairy animals. Okay, okay, There's certainly you, legislation you. in place to address disbudding. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. Um, look, we're just over the hour, so I'll, I'll one final question maybe for Laura, uh, and if you wouldn't mind just being brief, Laura, we are over the hour. Um, what, do, what do Ireland have in place currently? It's, I suppose it's more a general question. Uh, what do Ireland have in place currently to protect animal welfare? Well, I mean, we have the, the, the pig directive. We have EU-level um, legislation which protects all farm animals, actually. But um, and there is very specific legislation directed towards pigs the, under the pig directive. And I suppose pigs and poultry are the most protected um, farm animal species in Europe and therefore in Ireland. And also there is species specific um, calf protection. Bernie just mentioned some of it, uh, legislation in the EU. So really all our legislation is governed by the EU. We don't have any higher levels of some other EU countries have imposed higher restrictions than the baseline EU level. So all our animal welfare legislation is baseline EU level uh, legislation. And for cows and beef cattle, it's very, it's generic in terms of providing shelter and regular feeding and access to water. But there are moves afoot to, you know, revise the animal welfare legislation under the farm to fork um, um, program. And there are, the legislation is being looked at and there are possibilities in the areas of transport, et cetera, that you know more requirements are going to come in. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. And you made a great point earlier, uh, and, and Lauren as well, in terms of the need to bring in maybe animal-based indicators rather than the resource indicators that are currently used. So look, thanks. Um, this brings us to the end of this edition of Research Insights. Um, I want to thank all the attendees. I want to thank everyone for their questions. Um, we are moving to uh, the next Research Insight. Uh, will be in two weeks' time. Um, that's going to focus on uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, and antimicrobial resistance in, in farm animals. So for today, uh, I want to thank all our presenters for giving us an insight into some part of their research program. And I look forward to seeing you in two weeks time on the 9th of June. Thank you very much. <laughs>